thank you very much. Most of you we know. Uh, we're really grateful for you to come back. And those we don't, we welcome here. And this is a result announcement uh, for our full year 2017. So Brad will do most of the talking. I just want for those who don't know well, us well, to just remind you what we do. We're doing a bind build of scientific instruments. <laughs> We've done this for 12 and a half years. We bought uh, 16 businesses. Uh, why do we do this? Well, we think it's a very good market to do a bind build because the sector in which we have very good long-term drivers, there's a large pool of acquisition uh, available every year. And the companies we buy have very low working capital requirements and very little fixed capital requirement, which means that the cash conversion is very good and the money we make can get really quickly recycled into repaying the bank, borrowing again, and doing more deals. So, you know, we feel we have a, a, a nice track record of acquisition. And one of the things which helps us is we've acquired also with the years a very good reputation as an acquirer and with the reputation of being ethical and well-funded. I mean, meaning the deal will take place as we said it would take place and we, we never renegotiate heads but also uh, we, we're funded uh, without recourse to issuing shares, most deals, except the first one. And as a result of this, people have a certainty that the deal will get done. Uh, and we're very disciplined in uh, doing ac acquisitions. So we want to buy really businesses. We were really convinced they're sustainably uh, going to produce uh, earnings. And, uh, and we have to pay discipline price for this to work, which you know, we're disciplined enough to do. Most year we do a deal. We do on average 1.3 every year. At the bottom, you see a very, very small selection of the institutions we do business with, which are either companies or uh, universities or OEM customers. But of course, the list would be really long, and we deal with virtually every major university in the world and some more obscure ones in obscure countries. But also, we're very proud of the award we got of uh, the Queen's. We got four Queen's Award over our tenure of these companies for export and one for technology. And, and really, the key message is we've had very strong performance in 2017. is basically... Uh, due to strong order intake throughout the group and uh, very favorable exchange rates, the most favorable we've ever had. And uh, uh, this is very helpful for a company which uh, does everything here and exports uh, a, a very large proportion of its sales. Uh, we've continuing executing our strategy. We, we bought Oxford Cryo back in July and we increase our stake in uh, Bordeaux from a bit more than 50% to a bit more than 75%. In the last three years, we've really boosted research and development, and we always do well when we have a new product, so we've kept doing that. Uh, although in proportion to sales, it's gone down a bit last year because sales were good. And, and also, we, we've appointed uh, at the tail end of the year a new CEO, Mark Lavelle, who's here. So if you all meet him, you can ask him also questions, but he hasn't prepared any answers. And we're very pleased with that. He spent 15 years or 17 years, I never know how much it is, with Halma, which is a very good role model for Ross, uh, because they've done extremely well for their shareholders over many more years than us. And, uh, and, and five of these years, he was uh, the CEO of one of the Halma divisions, doing the job exactly that he is, needs to do and needs to be done at uh, a, a Judges Scientific. So really it's going to put a new emphasis not only on what's been really the, the main motor of our uh, shareholder value creation <laughs> has really been the deals, uh, but we're really putting, you know, we own more and more companies and the 
we have to put more emphasis now on also getting the best out of the companies we own and not only having always new ones. So, you know, we're very excited to have Mark. And uh, yeah, we, we started the year with a really good order book. We never had such a big order book to start the year. Uh, so that's a very good start. Uh, the beginning of the year has been satisfactory in terms of order intake. And a big question for us in our environment this year is sterling. It started to go up. Will it keep going up? Will it go down? Will it, you know, stay where it is? But we are sensitive to sterling and we prefer it when it's low. And now the results, over to you. Right, good morning, everyone. Just going to take you through the highlights from the past year. Um, revenues up a quarter to 71.4 million, up from 56 million the prior year. And that includes 17.7% organic growth. Profits have also grown strongly to 10.9 million, up from 7.1 million. That's an increase of more than 50%. And EPS has also progressed to 131.9 pence, up from 84.8 pence last year. Underpinning this result has been consistently positive order intake throughout 2017 and also following on the last seven months of 2016. I'll talk you through order intake in a bit more detail later. But the organic growth that I just talked about has been underpinned by 16% organic growth in order intake. So that's been pleasing, and we finished the year with a strong order book, 16.6 weeks. And the total order book was 14.9 <coughs> weeks. And the difference between those two, quite simply, is that we acquired smaller businesses and therefore they have shorter order books. In our group, when we generate good profit, invariably that turns into good cash flow, and this year was no exception. We generated 10.9 million cash from operations, and really that's gone to fund three things. One, the acquisitions that we did in the period, Two, to fund our growing dividend, which is up 16.4% this year, to 32 pence for 2017. And three, to also make sure we're paying down the acquisition debt. So net debt reduced to 8 million from 9.9 .9 million at the start of the year. We are a buy and build group. And so we're always looking for opportunities to increase the size of our group. And we're very pleased to complete the acquisition of Oxford Cryosystems in July 2017 for 5.1 million. That includes an earnout. And on top of that, as David just mentioned before, we also increased our stake in Bordeaux, the company that directly bought uh, Oxford Cry Systems, our majority owned subsidiary, and we, we increased that share from 51% to 75.5%. So taking you on to performance, revenues up by 25%, pleasing that we had a contribution both from the organic growth and also from our new acquisitions. Organic profits and contribution have increased by 50%, which is also, again, pleasing. And I've got a slide which will take you through the evolution of that in a little while. Just want to stop on tax rates for a minute, something which doesn't always get talked about too much. Our effective tax rate for this year is 14.2%. Really, that's driven by the reducing UK corporation tax rates and also by us being part of the SME R&D tax credit scheme, which is quite favourable for businesses like ours that invest in R&D. Our effective tax rate has, however, gone up a little bit compared to 2016 when it was 11.6%. And that's really as a consequence of better performance of the UK subsidiary sales offices that we have of some of our UK businesses. Lastly, for those of you that don't know our P&L that well, um, we talk about adjusted figures. Um, we do have some adjusting items that reconcile to the statutory result. The vast majority of that relates to non-cash amortisation of intangible assets that have purely been recognised upon acquisition, which is what IFRS requires us to do. And taking on to order intake, and really orders underpin everything we do. So if, I'm just going to walk you through the, the graph that's at the bottom of the slide. And there's three lines on this graph. There's a red line, a black line and a green line. The red line is our internal sales budget. And that's really set once a year alongside the budgeting process. And then when we make an acquisition, that's the only other time when that line will change. So you can see halfway through 2017, you can see there's a bump in the red line where it goes up, and that was corresponding with the acquisition of Oxford Cryo Systems. Now the black line is our trailing 12 months of orders. And so what we're looking for that line is that Come the end of the year, if it's 
touching on and around the red line, then that means we would have had sufficient orders to meet the prior year's budget. And our green line is the shorter term measure, which is the last four months of orders annualised. And what we're looking for that green line is really to track the red line as best possible, but it's going to be more jagged because order intake isn't always completely smooth. So what can you see on the graph? Well, you can see that the black line actually went slightly past the red line at the end of the year. So that meant we had a bit more than the total orders we, we needed per the budget last year. And the consequence of that, as you can see in the results. And the green line, for the most part, was pretty, pretty close to that, that red line, about as good as we normally expect it to be. So overall, that tells us we've had a good year, a good positive order intake, and that's the consequence you see of 16% increase in organic order intake. So we finished the year well, we had strong order books across the group and it, of course that enables us to go into 2018 with a strong opening order book. And since the start of the year, our 10 weeks order intake have been satisfactory. <coughs> Moving you on to revenue, we've had positive organic growth across North America, across China, rest of the world and also in Europe. The UK has gone down a little bit though, it's our smallest area but it has gone down a little bit and that really ref reflects the concerns over Brexit and the short to medium term concerns over research funding as <coughs> somehow we transition over from EU funding to, to UK funding. Um, you can see this split of, of revenue in the, in the bottom two pie charts on the page. So generally we have in and around 15% of our, or we call it a sixth of our revenue from the UK then a quarter from Europe, a quarter from North America, and a third from the rest of the world, which if you look is split up slightly, so you can see China around 11% and, and the balance for the rest of the world. It's also the first year where we've actually had um, geographical order intake to overlay over geographical revenue. And I have to say the picture is pretty similar. What's more striking, I think, though, on the right-hand side of the slide is the impact of waiting between H1 and H2. Um, at the start of 2015, we acquired Armfield, which is one of our largest businesses. And Armfield is very much weighted towards H2 performance. The consequence you can see in the pie charts where revenue has skewed a little bit to H2, but the impact on earnings is quite significant. And, and we expect that if the group stays constituted as it is to continue like that. Um, but more importantly, what it also tells you is that you shouldn't assume that the last H2 performance is going to tell you what H1 is going to give you. Moving on to the profit bridge, I think this is a very useful slide to help explain the evolution of our profit this year. So taking you from left to right, you can see 2016's contribution from our businesses. So this excludes central costs. The first column, two businesses we talked about last year as having low demand have both recovered satisfactorily. We've had some progress from the business which we stated had some production issues, and you can see again a, a small improvement to profit there. And then the organic group as a whole has performed very, very well. Just one or two of our businesses having a slight drop compared to the levels they were last year. And then the last column, acquisitions, that's the impact of the acquisition of Oxford Cry Systems, and also the full year contribution from the acquisitions we made in 2016. All in all, a strong position. Moving on to balance sheet and cash flow. You can see our net debt has reduced to 8 million from 9.9 .9 million. We've had really strong cash generation to cover more than fully both our acquisitions and the dividends. Just want to stop for a moment, just talk about one thing that's on the balance sheet here, which is our defined benefit pension. Um, in 2015, when we acquired Armfield, we acquired a defined benefit pension scheme with Armfield. Um, it's closed to new members, closed to further accrual, only has around 40 members, and it had its triennial valuation in March 2017, resulting in a liability that was broadly the same as it was the year before. And then lastly on here, you can see our working capital has reduced us across the group. David mentioned earlier about the benefits of the businesses we acquire having low working capital requirements, really reflects in the fact that the production issues in the subsidiary that had challenges in 2016 are beginning to subside. Moving on to cash flows, 100% cash generation from operating profit, so that's really pleasing. And what's that gone towards? Well, really funding the acquisition, repaying the debt, and funding those growing dividends. 
Onto the next slide, a really key statistic that we pay a lot of attention to is return on total invested capital, or ROTIC. And put simply, it's a function of the multiples you pay for the businesses you acquire. And so if you look on the left-hand side of the, of the graph, when we acquired FTT, our first acquisition, we paid close to a multiple of five times, and so we started just a little above 20%. And what do you need to do to improve ROTIC? Well, quite simply, you either pay lower multiples for the next businesses you acquire, or you improve the performance of your businesses, or both. And you can see for the first five years, we had really, really good performance. At the same time, when we then bought some larger businesses and paid higher multiples for them, GDS, Scientifica, that we paid six times for, they have a really big impact on ROTIC straight away. Hence, you can see the two big cliffs. And, and also a further one when we acquired Armfield in 2015. The bigger the business, the bigger the impact when you pay higher multiples. Um, and whilst we've had a, some challenges in performance um, in 2016, where you could see a dip, we finished around 15% at the end of 2016. We've had a good year in 2017, and that's pushed us back up to over 20% now. It's not a level that we're particularly happy with. And really we see with the group constituted as it is, a medium term target for us of 30%. Um, not something we, we can achieve overnight, but certainly something which we're working towards. On to the next slide, just briefly, just I think there's a couple of pictures quite useful for everyone to, particularly those that don't know us that well. Um, you can see the left hand pie that really given the size of our group and the number of businesses we now have, um, that no one company really dominates, which I think is important. And likewise with geography, again, no region totally dominates. If we have a problem in one country, it's not an issue for us. We have lots of other countries to sell to. So I'm gonna finish my bit off with a little bit about the long-term success of our group. Revenue, profits, EPS have all grown strongly over the history of our group. And over the last 10 years, we've had 9.5% compound annual growth rate on top of that for, for revenue, which when you think about us as a group whose business model is about buying companies with sustainable profits, I think is creditable performance. Dividends continue to grow at least 10% per annum. And again, this year, no exception to that with a 16.4% increase in the dividend. And really, we continue to focus on cash generation to help us ensure we can repay the debt fund a growing dividend and generate increasing returns for our shareholders. And I'll pass you back to David. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. And thank you all for listening. Mostly for those who haven't been here before, I you know, just wanted to re-emphasize a bit some of the aspects of, of, of our business model and why we really evolve. It didn't all happen, by the way, on day one. So it didn't come from our brain. I think we have to recognize it was a bit of pragmatism involved but when things are going well it's always good to think why they're going well and can we do more of that stuff which is good our sector contains a lot but a very large number of very small global niches and that's what we try to to do we try to buy companies which have a strong or dominating position in a global niche and because they're small, then we can buy them for something we can afford. I mean, really, this is, this is our game. So we, we think there's 2,000 privately held businesses in our sector in the UK. And, and people uh, tend to create these businesses when they're 40 and they leave a big group. And when they're 60, they want to sell. So if they keep them 20 years, it means that every year, you would have a hundred companies which come on the market need to be sold. And this is really you know, quite a fertile ground. So really our job is to find the 1.3 a year out of this hundred, which will really suit us and pay a discipline <coughs> price. Another thing which is important in, in our business model is the sector as a whole has good growth drivers. And sorry for repeating myself, a lot of you have heard this before, but really, there is an enormous growth worldwide in university education. Everybody in developed countries is now educated, which wasn't the case at all 25 years ago when it was only the intellectual or money elite. Today, everybody goes to uni. 
and it's even more true in the developing world. So the enormous growth in education, and of course a lot goes to technical education, and people need uh, instruments. So that's a very big, big driver, and it's not a driver for this year or next year. It's probably a driver for the next two generations. The other uh, big driver is the tendency of industry construction and every activity in, in, in the economy of the world to optimize everything they do. You know, what you did by instinct 100 years ago, today, or even 25 years ago, today you calculate everything to the nano unit of what you want to do. So everything has to be optimized. And if things are optimized, they need to be measured. You can't optimize something you haven't measured. So these two topics, I think, are going to be continuing. It's, it, it, it's not a thing for the short term or the medium term. It's a very good, good secular uh, uh, growth drivers. And, and, and we're benefiting from this. I have to say that you, you, you've seen, and, and we've seen in our sector in the UK, in the last five years, uh, a, a lot of companies having some ups and downs. We've had two downs over a period of 12 years. And we believe that this is due to uh, another driver, which is the medium term driver of, of, of our industry, which is, you know, a, a lot of our sales are financed uh, by governments. And since 2008, uh, there, there's been a, you know, a lot of ups and downs in global public spending. And so this has, on the long-term growth trend, you have a medium term, which is a bit more shaky. And we, we, we've seen this in the last few years. Uh, and of course, research and development is a very, you know, a very uh, uh, important thing for us and for ed everybody in our sector you, you, you need to invest in new products and be always up to date. And that's where really drives, uh, it, it drives our growth. So acquisitions, well, what are we looking at acquisitions? Well, we want companies which export a lot because I've said we want companies in global niche. Well, if you export half of your sales, it means half are in the UK and the UK is not half the world. So you can't be dominating in the world if you just sell in the UK. And, and we like solid EBIT margins. So why do we want solid EBIT margins? Well, if, if you have 5% EBIT margin and you're a scientist or an engineer, like all these guys are who sell us businesses, you, you know how to do the sums. And you know that if you increase your prices by 1%, you increase your profit by 20%. So that's obvious. Why don't you do it? Because you can't. So companies with a small EBIT margin are usually... In, in a very competitive field. We call it a price battlefield, so we don't buy them. But if you have 25% EBIT margin, it's that you can. So our gold standard is this, you know, 50% gross profit, 25% EBIT margin. So we want companies which generate sustainable profit and cash flow. I've explained why uh, there's good uh, conversion in our, in our industry. We've been paying three to five times for companies uh, which make less than a million EBIT and five to six times for companies which make more. In the first uh, type of company, we have very little competition and this is why we can pay less. But above a million, uh, above a million pound EBIT, there's a lot of competition, predominantly from private equity. And there's most often somebody with a lot of money that needs to be spent quickly and uh, will, will bid more than us. So we haven't bought a lot of these bigger companies. Uh, and and we, we've had you know, a, a, a very uh, fruitful relationship with the same bank that I've been dealing with for 28 years. And, and they're a key important in our business model uh, because people know that if we make an offer for a company, we have the money to do it. And they lend us money, uh, you know, like everything is cheap today. So we, we're allowed to borrow up to two and a half times EBITDA. And uh, we pay, you know, around like 3%, a bit less than 3%. And after the deal, 
we try to create a, an environment which is very propitious for companies to prosper. Uh, we, we have very strong financial controls, but we, we always need a very good MD and we let him run the company. Once a year, we have very big budget discussions and the rest of the year, he, he, he really runs the show and we say he runs the, you know, the, he's the captain of the ship and we, we just run the fleet. But of course now we have Mark and so Mark is going to give all these captains a bit more attention to help them run the, the ship a little bit better. And, and that's it and we repay the debt and we do the next deal. You know? so, and we, we also, and it's something that you know, Mark will also help us a lot with, of course as we get more mature uh, and we have had companies for you know, a, a longer period of time, we have more and more succession issues within the companies, whether MD or even other level within these companies. And it's something we have to really uh, uh, get involved with. And, and it's a very important task. It will be more and more important to deal with these succession issues. So we're, we're better equipped to do that. Uh, I just would say two words about Oxford Cryo Systems. Uh, we bought we bought it in July. This is a rare occasion of a company we tried to buy already twice before, and we didn't succeed. But the third time, lucky. It makes cooling system like cryo cooling system uh, for single crystals, uh, which are examined in, 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 in an X-ray machine. It's called X-ray crystallography. And uh, it, it works better if the crystal is, is, uh, is very cold. This is the technique which we use to identify the helix structure of life. And uh, so it's a very important uh, technique in, in, uh, in life sciences. And it's, a, you know, life sciences, you know, have good growth. This is a company which has managed to convince a lot of the uh, 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 makers of uh, this X-ray crystallography equipment uh, to abandon their own cryo systems and to buy from uh, Oxford. And as a result of this, uh, it's really got a very dominating position in the market, which is what we like. They have a side business uh, which they got involved recently, which is uh, radio telescopy, where you also have a need to, uh, to cool the horn of that uh, radio telescope. And they've been involved with a very large project in South Africa called Merkat, which is basically you know, a, number of, of, of a large number of dishes uh, which are put together. And of course, his computers managed to do one image with all these dishes. And, and, and we're bidding for uh, the biggest uh, radio telescope array in the world, uh, which is called the Square Kilometers Array, which basically is a set of 2,000 dishes which will have one square kilometer of receiving surface. So a very attractive company. Uh, for once, the management team is remaining, and we think they will remain, because they were not the founders, so that makes a big difference, and they're quite young. And basically, uh, after uh, the earnout was calculated, we paid five million won, because they made just a touch over a million uh, EBIT. And of course, we did it through Bordeaux with our partner there, and at the same time, we, we bought uh, half of the shares of our partner, or rather his wife. Both of these deals, we think, are uh, earnings enhancing and, you know, actually equally earnings enhancing. In summary, we have strong long-term growth drivers in our, in our sector. We have a robust business model that we pursue with great discipline. A lot of targets. Uh, we don't do acquisition which are going to be earnings enhancing in the future. We want them to be immediately earnings enhancing. We exclusively focus on shareholder value, which is profit, cash generation, repaying debt, 
growing the dividend and getting a suitable return on capital. And we believe that our shares uh, benefit from business poverty relief and therefore they're uh, uh, attractive for older people or, people who, or for people who manage uh, the money of older people because if you've held them for two years, there would be free of inheritance tax. Uh, we well diversify, so it's quite safe, uh, I think, in terms of geography and in terms of scientific application. And we've grown the dividend 10% or more or less 10% for the past 12 years. Uh, in fact, one year we missed it because we didn't do our sums properly, so we went from 3.3 .3 to 3.6. Uh, but every other year we've uh, done at least 10%, and it's a policy which we've made quite public. But of course, in the good years, we try to do more, provided we have good cover. And in fact, we've had a 24% compound increase since we started paying dividend in 2006. Could have wanted to ask any questions. Feel free. So just a question on the um, on the tax. I mean, clearly, you know, um, the uh, tax benefit um, from capital is very, very welcome. Um, and you know, you, you're also using the benefit of your you know, SME status. But the group is getting larger, and. Um, uh, things in the in the release this morning, employee numbers in the group are up to about 450 or so. Yeah. So there's going to come a point, in another acquisition or two, when you go through that 500 staff limit. As a so so um, at that point, how does the tax computation? Clearly, size brings other benefits, but in terms of the tax, so we l we lose the the we go onto the larger company scheme at that point, which is just not quite as friendly. So it's still helpful. We still will be able to um, use the R&D tax credit scheme, just not the SME version of it, which is just a little bit more lucrative in terms of recovering. With, with the acquisition of Darstrom, you've got a US presence. Has it actually been used for any of the other subsidiaries? Or so, so actually, Ed, I'll take, you, I'll take you back further than that. When we acquired Armfield, we got a US presence that was actually quite a proper sales office. Diastrom actually had one sort of one person, oh, okay. so and they've and they've still sort of got one person. What we've done is we've moved them to the venue of, of Armfield's office, and likewise, Scientifica opened an office as we said a year or so ago um, in the adjacent office, or the, in the adjacent offices in the office block that um, that Armfield are in. So we've got three of our companies with sales offices in the same the same area. So when I go and visit them a couple, a couple of times a year, it's just walk in the front door and I can either turn left or right. And I'm in either of the two main companies' offices and Diastron have a room in one of, those, one of those offices. It's a helpful hub. It means that instead of having three remote US offices, they're all together and they can talk to each other, which I think is helpful. I'm going back to the slide that shows the return on working capital, which is, starts at 20%, goes up to about 45% uh, between 2008-2012 and, mm -hmm. and comes back to 20%, you said you're not entirely happy with. But I just want to clarify, this is the uh, annual return on invested capital, yeah. which is still at 20%, it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, you had some golden years where it was 45% um, between 2008-2012. I'd just like to ask uh, how come they were so good and you know how can yeah, you I, I think yeah I think it's a good question like first of all what I have to say is that during that period you know I I, I think I talked about the aftermath of 2008 in 2008 <laughs> of course there was a complete meltdown of everything and then what happened afterwards is the private sectors everywhere started to deleverage. And this leverage went mechanically to governments. So suddenly the governments needed also to deleverage. And th there's been periods of stimulus because everybody was scared and also periods of belt tightening in various jurisdictions. So our sector started uh, to suffer from this in 2012. The first company in the UK to be affected was Andor. And the 
the companies were affected at different time. We we're completely unable to say why it was then and not at another time. We really felt it, you know, maybe we had a bit less organic growth in 13 and we really started feeling it in 14. And it's it, it, this has been influencing business in our sector ever since, even when we have a good year. It, we're not saying that we had a good year and this belt tightening is over. It's, it's not over. And well, you know, we'll have these influences are going to be there probably for, 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 for more years. Uh, so in the early part, what happened is two things. First, you know, we had fantastic organic growth. And secondly, we did deals very cheap. And also we were very small, so we could do only very small deals. So we didn't do any of the big deals that we were able to do later. So you see the impact of the big deals when we reached the top of 46%. Then, you, you know, GDS in March 2012 was a big step down because we bought something, you know, we were making 46% on, on, uh, on our investment and we were buying something making 167 So it's a lot less and it was big, so it had a big impact. So I think, you know, post that period, you've had two big deals. And, and you can see in 14, we had a big bad trading year. So instead of recovering like it did after GDS, well, after scientific, it didn't recover quite as well. And then Armfield was another step down, but you don't see the step because it's mixed with re mediocre trading. So then afterwards, it went up a bit and then went down in uh, 16, which was a bad year and back again in 70. So we're not happy with it. It's not good. Uh, why do we think that a suitable target is 30%? Is it 16, which was a bad year? If we take the worst, the two worst performers in, in terms of Rotik, we take them out, the rest of the group produce 30%. So we just need to deal with these two companies and once we've done this, we should be at 30%. We're not promising we're going to be at 30% soon, but we think it's a suitable target for us to say, let's deal with these two companies and we'll be, we'll be back to 30%. And uh, how is it going now with Armfield? Well, Armfield is much better. Armfield is one of these two companies. And Armfield is much better. I think we said in 16 that Armfield was <coughs> suffering from uh, the the low price of oil and commodities. Uh, Armfield sell uh, a lot to the undergraduate market, <coughs> i.e. to a lot of countries which are less developed than other companies in the group. We deal mostly with research and with postgraduate. Uh, and as a result, a lot of these companies are not, you know, so rich. And th those who are completely poor, like for instance, Ethiopia, get their money from uh, the World Bank for education. But those who are less poor or who may be a bit less developed but very rich, like in the Gulf, uh, they get their money from oil and commodities. And when commodity prices are low, then they, they tighten their belt and they don't invest so much in education. So Armfield had a much better year last year. How do you plan to get it back up to 30? I know David touched on that. Uh, it's, oh. it's improving the performance of our businesses. That's right. the, is this is the simple answer. There, there's, yes. it, it's it's no more complicated than that. It's the focus, working with them, and you know helping them drive the improvement. Do you think there's a lot of scope now for improving the businesses? I think I think there's always scope for improving These our businesses. Two, yes. But it, but even but even the other ones that are performing well, there's always scope to improve. Yeah. I think I think there's lots of other um, groups around the world that have proved that you can continue to improve businesses even when they're performing well. And I don't think we're any different. And I think with with Mark having joined the group, I think that will give us um, some added impetus towards towards driving that. I thought the cash conversion was really impressive given the growth. Um, what what's the right level? What, what's the sustainable level of, of operating and free cash flow conversion? If we talk about sustainable, we've done recently a calculation. We looked, because of course, we kind of, we, you know, we're obsessed with rotic. But if you have a good rotic, you're going to do well for your shareholders. So 
so, so really, the the nom- you, you all understand the rotic is uh, is really treating these companies that we buy as investments. So we invest money in it, and the money we've invested stay invested in it, even if we have to write down the assets by uh, some quirk of uh, the the accounting rules. You still have your money in it, and it has to produce that return. So, but but this calculation excludes head office, and it excludes any property that we may own. We we have uh, four properties, uh, which are all operating properties. So we exclude that, and we assume that they are let to the businesses where which occupy them. And uh, so the denominator is basically all the money we have invested in these companies. So recently we did this calculation. We said, so, so what is the denominator of all these companies? And what did we pay for these companies? And I think we found the denominator uh, was 58 million. And that what we paid was actually 56 million, including all costs. Or maybe it's the other way around. Basically, uh, we we have had. And uh, where does that come from? I'm sorry because I didn't answer your question straight, but that's the answer. The answer is if you don't need to put more money in these businesses that you bought, which I've just demonstrated on, in the long term, we didn't. Uh, then you have 100% cash conversion. So it's not quite 100% sustainable, but it is very, you know, yeah, that's our target. We, we like 100% conversion. We won't get that every year, but we don't need to add always money to keep these companies growing. They grow without absorbing money. Have you sold any businesses? No. We haven't sold any business. It's not our business model to sell businesses. Uh, we don't run them with an idea of selling them for more expensive than, than we paid, a bigger multiple. We're not in that game of, you know, trying buying companies and, uh, you know, squeezing profits out of them and then getting a better multiple because we rebrand them as something else than we bought them for. It's not at all what we do. Uh, and and uh, we... It may happen one day that we sell a business for a reason that I don't know, but is, we, we may at some point have you know, a good reason to sell a business. But what we have to see, it, 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 whatever business we would sell uh, would be dilutive because every company we buy, every purchase is strongly enhancing. So logically, every sale would be dilutive. So we would have another reason than wanting to enhance our earnings. Uh, my last question actually was going to be directed at Mark. Um, what are your initial thoughts and, um, uh, and do you see any opportunities um, to integrate some of the businesses, perhaps some of the back office functions, procurement um, or, or, or Okay. Um, I think that I'll take the second question first. Um, the, the group that I was at before, Halma, that, that's often seen as a sort of gold standard of, of this sort of process, um, believes very strongly, as I do, that that independence of these businesses is the critical success factor in them. And that um, I, I know that at Halma, every time the audit rotates, the, the new accountants who came in, their first suggestion was that we did more integration. And the group was built very much on the basis that actually in the end the independent benefits out trumps the 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 potential integration so I, I actually personally wouldn't go that route at all i think the the great thing you have with independent businesses is, is speed of action if you've got all your r d all your sales all your production and all your finance on one side it means that people can get together they can make decisions um you know something comes up at nine o'clock meeting at 11 action at two um, which is very different if you've got multi-site operations or you know, finances in Boston and production is in China and r and in India or something. So I won't be looking for any integration because from 20 years' experience, I think the independence is much stronger. Um, and are you satisfied that you've got the right reporting 
processes or tools that, 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 that have at hand. Um, Sixteen businesses, a lot of business. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I have to say that I've, because the businesses that in, in judges are on average about a half or a third of the size of, uh, of the, the previous group I was in, I was expecting in general the management teams to be a little less competent and the, the, the company's markets and niches to be a little less defensible. But, but I found exactly the opposite, actually. Um, I think that the, the, the management teams, and particularly the MDs in general, have been extremely strong um, and enormously knowledgeable. I mean, a typical MD um, you know, has a degree or a master's in the specialist subject that the company does, so knows the technology, probably spent 10 years as the sales director and is now the MD, so they, they know the technology, they know the market, um, and, and that's extremely powerful. Um, so I, I mean, there's, there's lots that can be done, and I think if I could just sort of combine those two points, I think there's, there's lots that the businesses can learn from each other without integrating. So there are, there are generic issues as an MD that you struggle with sometimes, you know, HR, legislation, um, that, and so one of the things that I'm in the process of doing is trying to get the MDs to talk to each other a little bit more, just to benefit from each other's knowledge, in, in, not in market specific stuff, but in just generic skills. Your acquisitions have tended to be UK focused. Are you yes. looking for acquisitions in any other geographies, uh, say Europe or the States? Yes. Uh, we haven't been very successful at doing them, though. Uh, we, but w w we're looking. I have to say two things first. Uh, I think I've talked very immodestly about our reputation as acquirer but a very important part of our business model, and we have a really good reputation. And as a result, we get a lot of spontaneous deal flow. But our reputation, although it does attain other parts of the world, is strongest in the UK, so create more deal flow in the UK. So we have a lot more deal flow in the UK than abroad. But still, we have deal flow abroad, including spontaneous. And we do look every year at a number of... Uh, acquisitions abroad and so we haven't done any so why and I, I think there's two reasons why although we nearly did one in 2008 but then our, our bank nearly went bust so we didn't have the money to do it and it was in Hong Kong and it was very large uh, I think there's two reasons for that I think we find that uh, it outside Anglo-Saxon countries and put particularly in continental Europe, where you have a lot of these companies, that basically in Europe or in America, Canada, and maybe in Japan, which is another story. But in, in, in Europe, they have completely different ideas of how to value a company. And usually when they do their calculation and we do our calculation, we're not at all on the same wavelength. Uh, and they're a lot more concentrated on the assets they have and the money they've spent whether they've spent it wisely or not wisely, they want it back plus a big premium. So it's very difficult to buy uh, in, in continental Europe, uh, but we we'll keep trying. And of course, in the States and in Canada and other Anglo-Saxon countries, they completely understand that we think in terms of EBIT multiple, but they have a different idea of EBIT multiples. So we find that also generally expensive. So that's reason number one is valuation. We found that in the UK, we found that we could exercise more discipline in, in pricing. But another uh, related thing is also due to pricing is that we're not interested in buying a company in the US making half a million pounds a year EBIT. It's really very dangerous and it's a lot of work. And if anything goes wrong, you know, you, you, you're going to have to keep going there the whole time. And it's going to be very burdensome. So we're trying to buy something a bit bigger if we're trying to buy something in the US. And uh, uh, of course, as I've explained before, uh, we're not very successful at buying bigger companies because of the competition we find. So we've bid for many companies in the US and Canada. Some were excellent but we haven't been successful in uh, bidding higher than our competitors. So these are the two reasons. Um, thank you everyone for coming.
Nice to see you all. Hope to see you in six months.